Hello everyone, this is uh, the monthly Yi Jing divination that I do, and I've already um, thrown the coins today, so we'll just kind of get into it. Um, I will be using my teacher's book, Changing the Zhou Yi, this one, Lu Ming's book, and then also the new book by Benabel Wen, which I really like. Um, yeah, I'll be using both of those to talk about the hexagrams that I threw this morning um, for asking the oracle, asking ancestors, asking heaven, uh, what is your advice for this time? Let's get into it. So what I threw was 45 turning into 12, sixth line changing. So if we go to 45, in uh, Lu Ming's book, we have assembly offering. The ruler is in the ancestral temple. It is favorable to meet an adept, auspicious. Sacrifice the ox, favorable when there is a place to go. Those are the overall uh, directions. And we'll go to the sixth line because that is the most important line of the reading, the changing line. Weeping and sobbing, no misfortune. Everyone is moved by a collective sense of success. Emotions run high, but expressions stay modest. Having assembled together properly, the group enjoys the loss of their individual loneliness and ineptitude. The image of this hexagram, which is a lake over earth, the trigrams are lake over earth, is about assembling an entire clan before the altar of the ancestors. Spiritual, social, and material resources are gathered and put into order. Everyone gathers to perform a collective rite that expresses a true and great unity of spirit. Since the ties of unity are not politically created via some kind of promise, but found in the blood, success is inevitable. This is a festival of natural unity. The auspices for this hexagram, beneficial for all joint efforts, be receptive to the inevitable success that comes from joining together with others, expect emotions to run high and epiphanies on all sides. Ming's comment is, unity with others is a wonderful feeling. This describes a ritual that bears our collective spirit to its source, the ancestors, in a festive ritual that is devoid of hypocrisy and artifice. The gathering identifies our spiritual roots, our commonality. The feeling of unity is the source of all true human emotions. When we sincerely open our hearts in this way, we are naturally purged of our selfishness and wantonness. Through this exchange, we may enter into the depths of human spirituality. There is no greater gesture than this ritual of rituals. That's the first one. And I will sort of locate it as we go along in the greater context of the season that we are in. And, of course, we have the changing line, what it changes into. Um, so let's go into what it changes into, and then we'll kind of circle back around again. So number 12 is P, obstruction. Obstructed by inferiors, inauspicious for princes, the great departs and the small approaches. Obstruction is a situation in which good or superior people are temporarily held back by minor obstructions. This includes mistakenly working against your own fate. It is also about a time when inferior, small-minded people prevail. When the best people are stagnant, held back, or obstructed, change for the better is inevitable. Obstruction is not a time for going forward. You are blocked by your own pretense or by external circumstances. Be humble and patient and cancel or postpone great plans. Adaptation and patience are the keys to positive change in the future. The comment from Ming is that this is about a temporary obstruction of good people, appropriate words, and or progressive ideas. I mean, this makes sense when you look at what's happening in the world today and how um, progressive, non- or anti-authoritarian uh, dynamics, people, words, are being actively suppressed. 
This uh, hexagram is an obstacle that arises from the distractions of petty ideas or flattery. The situation can and should be resolved by adaptation, not overcome by force. This is going to be something we have to come back to, especially in the dragon year, where we think that we have more power than we actually do, and the impulse control is extremely important to think about. When obstructions of this kind occurs, the Zhou Yi advises us to accept the given situation without complaint or struggle and wait for natural clarity to return. Once clarity resumes and liberation is accomplished, return to normal, which is home, whatever that is, home base, return to normal progress as soon as possible. Let the pettiness go and do not hold a grudge. Okay. So before I get into Benabel's uh, sort of version of this, um, we will just kind of circle around a little bit. So we are here in the spring. I believe it's a fire tiger moon. Um, it is still early spring. It is not quite the end of winter. There's quite an overlap between what we consider winter and spring to kind of the begin and end of it. There's this quite an overlap where spring begins, but then winter kind of comes, surges back and oscillates back and forth slowly until the yang of spring becomes so prevalent that we consider it to be spring and then it's kind of automatic, like almost immediately summer, right? Um, in a certain sense. But remember, these things are happening gradually over time. They're happening underneath us. They're happening behind the scenes. We are sort of feeling very downstream sensations or perceptions or emotions based on these very upstream uh, workings that are happening behind the scenes. Okay. We're also in this Yangwood Dragon Year. I did a whole write-up about that, so please go read that and also read all the other colleagues' writings about that. I have them all in the Substack um, organized, so you can read all about it. Um, but let's just remind us that, you know, this is going to be an entire year that is kind of like springtime energy, but that doesn't mean that we can disregard every other factor that is happening simultaneously, which includes winter still being here and this kind of newborn feeling that is extremely fragile. And we might have a lot of big ideas and big dreams because we felt so restricted by both the winter and the entirety of the last year, which was a water rabbit year, which was kind of like a wintry year. So if we feel like we've been imprisoned and that this is liberation, we might break our ankle right out of the gate. Okay, and so this is a big issue for human beings who are sort of being um, crafted like a bonsai tree to become more and more addicted and more and more kind of easily controlled via propaganda. Um, this is what the algorithm does. It, it is a... It is the psychology of addiction and how to get people more addicted. That's what it is. And so we have to recognize that we are in a state of affairs, in a societal state of affairs that is still extremely fraught with danger. We are not free. We are not liberated. We are sort of in a tenuous tug of war between the forces of sort of authoritarianism and the forces of what we could say liberation. And as much as the young wood dragon year could be used by activists and, and freedom fighters to g gain a lot of support for their big ideas and their progressive ideals, that, that could be true. It's also equally as true that the energy of impulsiveness the energy of big ideas can be utilized against us via the propaganda machines of those who are already entrenched in power, which is corporations, uh, big business, the lobbying industry, which and the election year, which, of course, is all about how to 
trick people into being on your side so that you can fuck them over and take advantage of them. I mean, this is what we've been dealing with for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, this kind of demagoguery, kind of like straw man arguments, biases, fallacies, in order to trick the amygdala and the kind of easily scared versions of our networks in our brain, those ghosts, essentially, in order to sort of get the ghosts to run the show, okay? And so while we could use the bright yang chi of this year to dispel the ghosts and do um, healing exorcisms, it's also equally potential that we could just um, be hit by lightning, which would kill us. <laughs> and not necessarily exercise the ghost, but it might. So what we're trying to do is exercise the ghosts without dying or getting hit by lightning. And sometimes uh, our fate is so uneven for many people that we will die in order to exercise a ghost. That's sort of one way that is a natural, inevitable way to heal or resolve fate is to die. Um, this doesn't mean that this is good or bad, it's just a way that happens. So I just want to be very clear, the depths to which I'm talking about are not merely this dualistic world in which we're fighting for progress against authoritarian forces in some kind of like chess battle um, in the material world. Okay, so there is another world that makes this world possible where the lightning comes from, right? Where's Where the lightning actually comes from and goes back to this kind of utter darkness. Um, that's sort of maybe the real world, and we're living in a dream of that world. And yet we have mostly only this world to reference. But in these teachings, we're actually trying to reference the other world as well. We're not trying to just reference this world in a dualistic way so that we can be better tacticians and sort of get our needs met and have victory poses on the podium or something like that. We're actually trying to open our senses and our perception to the vastness of reality, which includes this other world that is in some way we never quite see clearly. Right. We never quite are able to discern because we're using the eyes of this world to look at that world. And what a lot of these practices are designed to help us to do is to recognize that we also have a set of eyes or multiple sets of eyes in order to not just look at that world from this world, but to look from that world to this one. OK, which is to say the, the eyes that are always there that you have access to can peer back at you and you can actually have a real moment of connection and contact. It is not merely like we are knights on a quest in the dark forest and we're going to sort of bring light to the darkness. It's not really like that. It only appears that way at a certain stage of development or at a certain part of the perceptual cycle where it appears as if that is a story that is true. So I really need to get this through to people that the fight for liberation cannot be won unless we also see from that world into this one and from this world into that one in a way that is not a fight for supremacy. We are not the light fighting against the darkness. Um, we are not the yang fighting against the yin and we are not the form fighting against the formless. We are not living fighting against the dying or fighting against the dead. This is exactly what Back to the hexagram, 45 is telling us the assembly of unity is an ancestral right. It's a veneration. From my perspective, this veneration is much more like what Ming says, 
a festival of natural unity. And that festival, that festivist quality is extremely important so that we don't become so overly serious the way that um, ritual is often perceived in our secular world. Like a kind of, it's either... It's either nonsense or it's ultra morbidly serious. And what we need to understand, and this is very important, is that this kind of ancestral veneration is a celebration. Mardi Gras, Carnival, is an ancestral ritual where a lot of bodies, and I was just in the Portland one uh, walking with, with them a little bit uh, with everyone else, not like a special person, just, you know, that's what happens. And it's a very small example of this larger phenomenon I want to talk to you about, which is becoming the body of the dragon or becoming the body of the snake, which is a giant procession of cellular entities in body form, moving, dancing, yelling, shouting, having reactions and making expressions, making music, and that snake is long, that body of that snake is long, it's made up of all of us, and we are all representatives of our ancestors. We are taking on the mantle of representing our ancestors in that great ancestral procession. You and me and he and she and they and everyone else um, representing our commonality through a festival ritual procession that has a structure and brings back to us the feeling that we all were born from in this world from that world and so understanding that when we come together for that level of ritual that is when we feel the depths of our spirituality okay where we can pray and dance and sing and cry and shout and laugh and melt down and have an epiphany and everyone's doing it and we're all in the same body and we don't need to really talk about it too much because the expression of that phenomenon that we are feeling or perceiving is the offering back to the ancestors in a great circle, in a great cycle, right? A great kind of river that circumnavigates the sphere of the earth or you know and I can go on forever about the poetic metaphorical you know aesthetic realities that we would want to embody but also recognize that in our natural state those forms those sequences those um, phenomenons those intracellular biochemical reactions, all of that is part of what's happening already without us doing anything, right? So it's like riding the horse. We ride the horse, we ride the dragon. This year is all about riding that dragon, but riding the dragon is like surfing a wave. We don't control the ocean. We have to have skill in riding that current. So, back to the hexagrams a little bit to reorient ourselves. We're in the beginning of spring. All these little sprouts are sprouting. That great wave is coming. However, it's very easy to destroy new growth and new birth and babies of any kind. So we have to become extremely careful. So, a ritual such as what? 45 is describing would be a way to curb our natural tendency to trample on the new growth and ruin it and then we don't get to have a kind of summertime and then a harvest in the fall that we would actually need to survive the winter we would essentially ruin or blow our load too fast and then suffer the consequences of our own immature perspective, okay? So part of 
what this energy is requiring of us is to remember what it felt like to be so young and new and full of energy and ideas, but also to not let the four-year-old ride the school bus or drive the school bus. They're not capable of doing that right now. The inner child is sort of there as a kind of light source, right? It's the yang that brightens and refreshes our capacity to see new things clearly and in a new refreshing way that is not based on old stagnant patterns. But it is just a light source and that light source can go out, it can be shut down, it can be closed off, it can be destroyed by our own inability to protect that light source because we're so busy trying to save the world that we actually destroy it in the process of saving it, right? So we have this great ancestral ritual, which I'll say is the great dragon of Carnival, you know, and we have to summon our capacity to be in that joy together more often especially in the next month. But that doesn't mean we make great actions or have great plans of attack. And when we think of this advice that we were given today through this oracle, we have to measure all of that against the very real genocides that are happening right now in which people are being blood sacrificed for authoritarian power structures and supremacist power structures. And so while we may not make these big plans, we still have to act. This is hard. So perhaps that is what the second hexagram is telling us, that for a period of time, let's go back, for a period of time, we will be obstructed. We will be obstructed by inferiors. When a situation in which good or superior people are temporarily held back by minor obstructions, and this includes mistakenly working against our own fate, so we're working on that. We're working on not being the problem. But we're also recognizing that it is about a time when inferior, small-minded people will prevail. Temporarily, but they will prevail. And when the best people, the ones with clarity, sincerity, honesty, collective integrity, collectivist integrity, are stagnant, held back, or obstructed, change for the better is inevitable, like the seasons. It is inevitable that the rains will come eventually. So um, let's switch to Benabels and see if we can glean any extra, you know, insight from what that is. So let's start with 45. Let's start with 45. Bear with me. I really wish that they had sort of put the numbers on the edges of the pages because that would have been really useful. I might have to go through this book and like tab them all because, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> we have to tab it somehow. Okay, we're almost there. We're almost there. Dun, dun, dun. Here we are. Assembly 45. Yeah. So I'll just read some what, what, what uh, this good woman has, has written here. A leader rises among them. You are destined to gather the people in congregation and unite them under your purpose. This talks a bit about demagoguery, a little bit, but take care that when you do, you are also prepared to handle the strife that is bound to arise when people congregate. Ooh, that's very good. This is your forewarning. Have a contingency plan in place. It's not about personal sacrifice. It's about aligning personal will with heaven's will. Choose progress. Start now. All right. There's a little bit more. The lake collects water. And so it's lake on top of earth. So the lake collects water, which seeps into the earth and enriches it. A fish and a dragon gather in assembly. 
<clears throat> the sage is called to refine another, a warrior of great talent and ability. Stop not the Zhou Yu, which is a mythical creature. The king enters the ancestral temple, favorable to go meet the eminent one, an auspicious omen, an honorable leader or messiah arrives. The sage must sharpen the weapons. The weapons will be needed to battle the dangers ahead. Regarding the warrior, this could also be a reference to an ethnic group that often invaded the Zhou, the Quan Rong, who claimed ancestry from two sacred white dogs and venerated the white dog spirits as the emblem of their clan. The king entering the ancestral temple is a reminder to be humble and honor your roots. Great fortunes to come from proceeding. So this talks a little bit more about the archetypes from the time of the Zhou dynasty, which include sages or priests, uh, shaman kings, um, prince warriors who are on their way to become shaman kings, and how the sage or the priest was in direct assistance to guide those young beings, those, those very young-like archetypes towards a good outcome for the people. Um, so it's almost like saying, if you don't start a cult, that's good. The people will just join a cult, any cult they find. So you have to sort of become extremely careful about how you gather this assembly of forces and recognize that in just gathering, you're going to have problems because people can't really be together very well in a nation state. And this is a still nation statehood. This is a post Neolithic animus, animism, post hunter gatherers, although there are still hunter gatherer kind of clans around. This is talking about the kind of social unrest that does happen when you bring a lot of unrelated people together and just kind of put them into caste systems and sort of go, that's the way it is now. So we went from sort of being all related in a clan in a particular region to becoming kind of homeless wanderers that sort of jump from clan to clan or nation state to nation state based on the sort of whims of these uh, you know, the psychological and physical phenomenon like wars and um, takeovers and kind of like tribal battles and all this crazy bullshit that we've been going through for thousands of years now. So it's just talking about how to manage that, essentially. And we'll go to the sixth line and see if there's anything to glean about that. With both hands, I weep tearfully and there is no blame. Okay, so this talks a little bit more about what that sixth line would actually maybe be about. And uh, TLDR, it's about the natural misperception that occurs through wrong hearing that happens all the time when we live in our Tower of Babel society where we don't have a shared cosmology. Okay, so... It's from the first person perspective, you proposition another and you are rejected. You are misunderstood. The rejection stings and you lament, you cry. The other, the other person who rejected you sees you lament and through that finds you sincere. Your intentions are finally made clear and the other will have a change of heart and then accept your proposition after first misunderstanding you. In the end, after the weeping of tears, the union you seek will come to fruition. The sixth line implies a first-person perspective and an expression of anxiety that you are at the risk of erring or that any successes are short-lived due to a great deal of uncertainty. That's the society we live in. All, our all of our successes are short-lived due to a great deal of uncertainty. And this is someone at the top whose position is threatened. Well, we don't have to think even about being at the top. We just have to think about our position being threatened, which is a constant way that they control us in this society because we're always being threatened with poverty and homelessness and exile all the time. But there is no blame. The line that says that there is no blame is a reference to one's innocence as difficult circumstances arise. 
I think this is kind of like how children are very innocent, but they are often seen as bad or misunderstood because they just don't have the clarity or the experience or the wisdom to understand how everything they say could be used against them. Back to the text, this is not a matter of cause and effect that you put into motion, and it's not a matter of karmic retribution. So this is to say that even our minds, always thinking there's cause and effect, and always thinking, well, if it isn't cause and effect, it's karmic, it's retribution. This is saying there is a phenomenon in the world that is neither cause and effect nor karmic retribution. Very important to understand. But there is a great sense of injustice in the matter at hand. So there's a great sense of injustice. We feel betrayed. We feel like there's injustice. But this is not cause and effect, which is to say we didn't really make it happen, even though people want to tell us that we did. And it's also not karmic retribution. So it's something else. It's just the natural mysterious of our relationality and how we constantly misperceive. The final line here is a pro final prognostication here suggests that no irreparable harm will come to pass, however, which is to say, even though there is a sense of great injustice, if you are authentic and actually show that how sad you are and continue to talk with the person or the group they might find you sincere and then apologize for misunderstanding you. And then somehow it's just water under the bridge. Okay, let's move to 12 and then we'll kind of finish this up. So. Da, 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 da. Here we go. In this one, instead of obstruction, uh, it's kind of named stalemate, which is another way to think about it. And just briefly here, we have a few different ideas. So in the trigrams now, because one of them changed, instead of having lake over earth, we have heaven over earth. And it, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but... Here's what it says. What should be flowing is going stale. The ill-intentioned are blocking the flow. There's a risk of loss. Practice the virtue of frugality to alleviate difficulties, but incompetence prevails. Honor the gods and ancestors for protection, which was the last hexagram. And come what may, no matter how grave the inequity, you cannot falter in your own virtue. Do not let their malignity erode your integrity. If you want to know why the malevolent has come out victorious, you may ask the oracle. So this is sort of saying we could do a follow-up to this. Why do the malignant prevail, or why are they prevailing? That's very interesting. However, let's go into some of the more uh, final things here. Heaven and earth divided. Heaven and earth, the trigrams divided. Stagnation, cessation of movement. In times of poor harvest, the sage conserves. Despite difficult times, desperation does not lead to decline of virtue. Desperation does not lead to decline of virtue, which is to say, do not give in to despair and let it ride you like a possession. Do not let the spirit of despair possess you and ruin your virtue. The sage receives no blessings or gains and no favors are earned. The great depart and the inferior arrive. The malice of others creates an impasse. There has been a halt in growth and progress. No advancing, no flow. Boding ill for good intentions Poor prospects if a union is contemplated. Practice the virtue of frugality to alleviate difficulties. This is about conservation of energy and chi, holding back, being very cautious, not trampling the flowers, not trying to spend more than we have. Um, dangerous time. Heaven and earth are estranged. As a result, 
Big losses and small gains. Mm -hmm. It's real talk here, people. You know it's your turn to move, but you don't know where to go. Feeling like a draw. Stalemate. Final line, though. Change the game. Change the game. That is a matter of perception to be able to see that you are playing a game and that there is other or there are other games to play. Very important. So there's some really good extra stuff in Benabel's uh, translation and uh, commentary about these things. So hopefully this was a benefit to you and all your relations. We're going to close it up here so I can do all the editing. Um, like I said before, just a few announcements. Um, I have written a whole uh, write-up on the Yongwood Dragon Year. Um, I am also hosting a Death Clown Online class that is drop-in that uh, hopefully will be more in March, but for right now it is on this Saturday the 24th. And you can find all that information on my Substack, uh, thenightgarden.substack.com. And as always, I'm doing a lot of this work sort of on my own with no funding. And so uh, donations are necessary. I came up with a new catchphrase. Let's see if I can do it. All right. Sharing is caring and donating is liberating. And we can kind of imagine that like some kind of Care Bear thing across the sky. Um Please share my work with people who might actually use it uh, properly. Um, there's a whole bag of cats there that I don't want to get into. A lot of people hate me and my work. Um, and that's not, my work isn't for them. Okay? My work isn't for you know who, who uh, needs to do a thing about me. Um, but... For those who are outsiders, for those who are chronically sick and poor and intelligent and uh, perhaps have been touched by the oracle in some way, hopefully I am helping you to make sanity of this world and have a death practice. Um, I don't want to get far, too far into it in this post, but just understand that um, my generosity is limited and cannot last forever. Um, there will come a time when I do not have the resources anymore. And part of that is a community issue. And I don't know what else to say around that, but I do thank uh, the ancestors for allowing me to survive death multiple times in order to try to get through this next phase of my reality. And I don't know how and I don't know where I'm going but I am trying to help via this kind of information it's not for everyone it's not feeding the algorithm it's not feeding the cycles of addiction and therefore it is not popular and it will not make me a lot of money um, but perhaps there are some very wise wealthy people who would like to help me continue to do my work and that this is a somewhat of a prayer uh, to the ancestors to uh, help assemble those kinds of people so that maybe we could do something bigger when the auspices are correct. So thank you all so much for listening. Blessings to you and all your relations. May this be of benefit to all our relations, including the hungry ghosts, the demons, and all of the other forces. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness, peace and the causes of peace, liberation and the causes of liberation, etc., etc. So, thank you all so much. See you when I see you.